Welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 101. Today is Tuesday, March 19th, 2013. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Jules, Kurt from Room 101, and Noki Travers to update us on the rant situation. Hi, everybody. Hi, Christina. Good afternoon, Christina. Kurt, thanks for being here today on, with your uh, Room 101 on our 101 show. And I how appropriate, to, huh? <laughs> wanted to make sure people know how to find your stuff. You've been covering a lot of issues about police brutality and things like that. Where can people find your stuff? Uh, well, the uh, the site for the show is room101radio.net. The, uh, and then I have another site that uh, I've been working on, another project, mybrotherskeeper.com. Uh, Brothers with a Z, mybrotherskeeper.com. That, that's the site that really focuses on all of the uh, police brutality stories and, uh, and and whatnot. Lots of uh, in, in informative links uh, that you can get from there. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, until <laughs> until the uh, train stops Sunday morning, uh, 9 a.m. at Oracle. And, yeah. of course, Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Uh, here at UCY, tomorrow night. Yeah, for you guys that don't know, um, Oracle is being uh, disbanded, unfortunately. So we're going to have a lot of people without a home in radio, we might be switching up our schedule a little bit over here. I'm not sure yet how all that's going to work out. But thank you so much for being here, Kurt, and helping us no problem. with clips all the time. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And we've had some great conversations with you, too, about some of the uh, current issues of today. And you have a possible writing project that you might be starting soon? Uh, yeah, there's a a local uh, paper here that that really you know focuses in and uh, brings a lot of attention to a lot of the things that uh, you, you you may hear some of the hosts here at UCY uh, at Oracle and other networks uh, talk about, uh, namely drones and and fracking, of course, being a big issue uh, here in this particular area. Uh, one thing I noticed looking through that paper is that they didn't have anything really focusing in on the uh, the, the rising issue and the escalating issue of paramilitary uh, uh, police units, police brutality. So I contacted them, and they have, a, uh, I guess, a big committee meeting uh, tomorrow. And uh, the lady I spoke to uh, seemed very, uh, very interested in having me maybe write a, a, a small column uh, monthly. Uh, maybe focusing on a particular case or uh, talking about, you know, how to deal with interactions uh, when you come across a, uh, uh, a cop. And uh, so I, here in the next couple of days, hopefully I'll, I'll be getting some good news about maybe doing a, uh, a little writing project for a local publication here. So Good. Good luck Excited. with that. Let us know how Thank you, you find out. I will. Uh, Monday's the day that I kind of review all the stuff that I want to cover during the week, although sometimes things will happen and my schedule just completely goes out the window. I wanted to talk about um, Dr. Helen Caldecott's symposium today, and I never got a chance to really watch any of the talks that I didn't see at the time that it was live streamed. Well, I did have a few conversations with people about what they thought of the conference and um, just some of their observations. But as you all know, yesterday we found out uh, kind of early in the day that there had been a power outage at the Fukushima plant, which may have even affected the Daini plant. I haven't been able to verify that, though. Now, I made a little um, countdown timer of when exactly we should start panicking about this, because right now I'm not. The reason why is because this is the third or fourth time that this has happened in the last two years. TEPCO has been able to fix the problems in the past, and so hopefully they will again. What I've learned is that there were five engineers that were going to be working around the clock to isolate where this problem occurred. And the most recent post on any news, this is from Informable, TEPCO is still unable to restore power at all affected facilities. This, by the way, includes Reactor 4 and the common spent fuel pool. After further investigation, they announced that the switchgear in the process building, the common fuel pool, and Unit 3 and 4 switchgear had been found to not be operable. Workers were unable to determine what caused the boards to stop functioning as no visible damage was found. 
They later repaired two of the boards but are currently using an emergency power generator to restore cooling for the Unit 4 spent fuel pool, while the Unit 3 spent fuel pool and common fuel pool are still not restored. Out of all of the spent fuel pools, well, 1 through 4 and the common one, because we never hear anything about 5 and 6, although those are probably loaded to the gills too, 4 is the hottest, the common spent fuel pool is the second hottest. And um, I'm not sure what, how 3, 2, and 1 all relate to each other, but there is information that's released on a daily basis, usually on a daily basis from TEPCO, about what the exact temperatures of these pools are. They have been rising. It looks like, you know, they're putting this emergency generator in, which I would have thought they would have done right at the beginning of this, to keep the hottest pool down as low as possible. And we've got, like... I know there's a varying of opinions, three to five days before you really need to start worrying if they aren't able to um, resume that cooling process. So it's, it's kind of a situation that changes hour by hour. And I had a lot of discussions yesterday. Um, we had some really epic discussions and some very funny discussions on Radiation Watch yesterday. And I had a couple of phone calls with people. I talked to Miss Milky and I talked to Noki and... You know, the bigger problem is how this is all going to shake out in the long term. Because when you're looking at 30 to 40 years for decommissioning, I have never seen an estimate of how long it's going to take to get the fuel out of number four, let alone one, two, three, and four, five, and six, and the common spent fuel pool. You know, everybody concentrates on four because the building is so weak foundation wise that's the one out of all the areas that needs to be prioritized but all they're really going to do is take the stuff out of four and either put it in the common spent fuel pool which is like a, a big one that's up 50 feet away from the reactors or put it directly into dry casks and they experiment experimentally removed two a few months ago we thought that they were starting it all they did is remove these two and they never removed any others these cannot be out in the air. This is not just like pulling them out with a crane and putting them somewhere else. They have to be, um, you know, it, the zirconium cladding that is around these things will ignite when it's exposed to air. So this is going to be a really, really, really delicate operation. And when you consider how long it's going to take just to do four, and then all the other ones and how many things can go wrong in the interim in terms of earthquakes, a possible tsunami, um, electrical problems like what happened yesterday. Also, there was a nuclear engineer that said there's a seal in the bottom of these pools, and if that seal gets weak and lets go, there's no way you're going to be able to keep water in the pool. So, I mean, there there's a, a bunch of different issues. Right now, I would say if this problem isn't resolved by Friday, then I would really start to worry. And uh, I'll post, I posted the countdown clock for you guys uh, in the chat room. Um, the only way to really calculate an exact time that things would go really bad is if you had a physicist who was also a statistician that could do a calculation, which undoubtedly would be a huge number, um, using TEPCO data, so there's a lot of variables here, of what exactly is in the pool, um, what's hot and what's not, how hot is it in terms of decay and so forth. There's heat that's also released from the sides of the pool because it's metal. There's, they have to consider the volume of the water. I mean, there's just so many variables. So I'm just going with Friday. <laughs> Noki, I don't, do you have an opinion on this at all? I'm on the same, uh, I'm on a watch mode on the crisis over there because um, I'm much more concerned about this uh, new report about the tanks are leaking and they got all this groundwater and uh, somebody says close the harbor, but we saw our, for our record breaker fish this week oh yeah i've got that article up and loren's response to it too and i saw several models that were floated this week for pacific cesium distribution mm -hmm. i want us to also note at the same time that 
a report was put out on how cesium can uh, leave the Pacific Ocean and enter the atmosphere and travel atmospherically. So a lot of these compounds, just because they touch down somewhere, if it's in the ocean, that's not necessarily uh, going to help sequester any of that those isotopes. Yeah. You got you got your debris coming in, and they they're saying it's coming in a little hot. Yeah. Uh, I personally have heard from a lot of Hawaiian people who are very, very concerned because of the coral. And then we had the seals report that all these sea mammal uh, pups aren't doing very well. So I'm concerned about the, sea, the isotopes. We had a little blip last week. I think it was earthquake related, but I do notice that uh, reactor one and four, there's a, the, the ambient readings took a big jump this week. Mm -hmm. And so we had a little bit of a quiet spell, and then uh, the whole weekend is kind of rocking and rolling with the rats. And uh, we broke the alert limit in Minnesota. Uh, Chandler, Arizona was another hot spot. So, uh, I'm pretty sure this stuff can only come in on the winds if it fluctuates daily. Today's kind of quiet. My bag is that a lot of the stuff ends up uh, being sequestered uh, in a recycling format all around the Great Lakes. Yesterday, like when you told me that and I looked, it, we had 95% humidity here. When I looked on the map, your your area is one of the worst in the country, and it looks inverted to me. So anytime you get a temperature inversion, it's going to press that atmosphere down on you, and it's going to stand still, and things fall out, and I don't ever feel good. Um, my physical health, I notice it right away when I get into those inversions. If your town has a background of over 50 counts per minute, you need to tighten up your house and get some internal air filtration and have all the mitigation clean shoes that for the inside. So, but mostly I've been plume tracking and there's quite a bit of radiation that still is coming out of Fukushima. I noticed that Tokyo had an alert yesterday, like mm -hmm. on a switch. It seems to me there's something active right now over there that, of course, we'll never know about. But the radiation readings across the country aren't going down. They're creeping up and staying up. So that's yeah, I guess Arnie Gunderson was quoted in Bloomberg too, although I don't I don't have it up in front of me, but uh, saying that you know there was a direct correlation with rad levels and the pool temperatures as the temperature rises you would expect to see the rad levels rise and uh, we did see uh -huh. some of that in tokyo yesterday and that's where the wind was blowing there was a map put out by a uh, swiss monitoring agency that showed that the emissions from the fukushima plant were directly blowing towards tokyo unfortunately and this was happening overnight i think it's too cold there right now for people to be sleeping with their windows open no, and that correlates exactly with what happens here when in the afternoons when the temperatures and the big winds get moving, that's when we see our kick bit mostly. Uh, I, I don't have enough power to run being on the radio and talking to everybody. And so my, my Geiger system crashed under all of this. Yeah. But I'm looking right now at Radiation Network's public site, and uh, we're doing about as good as it's a very moderate day here on the continent. Something that was brought up yesterday in some of these chats, too, was, uh, you know, I need to go get tape and things like that to have ready. And, and truthfully, 
you guys should already have all that stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't expect every, people to buy like a respirator for everyone in their family because they're fairly expensive. You know, they're like 25 bucks a person. If you've got three or four people in your family, that's a lot of money to put out for something that you don't even know if you're ever going to use, but at least have a box of face masks and extra masking tape and some extra food and water for a multitude of reasons. You know, there was some very uh, sketchy stuff going on with Chase yesterday. Uh -huh. And you got a little taste of what it would be like if all of a sudden the banks don't work and you can't get uh -huh. any money. I don't know how many people know about this, but the Chase oh, banking can't. system went down <laughs> and everybody's account showed zero. Oh. Unless, unless you had a loan from them, then it showed how much was you still owed on your loan. <laughs> But if you have a savings account or a checking account, and I saw this posted in a forum, and this guy had originally said he his wife was at the vet with their cat who has cancer, and they weren't going to see the cat until she paid up front because she needed like $600 worth of tests for this cat, and they wouldn't do it because her bank card wouldn't work. And he's like, I know we have money in that account. I don't understand what's happening when he... Um, went to check his balance online, it said all of his accounts were zeroed out. So I go online, all of my accounts are zeroed out, and my daughter's. Oh. And I'm like, holy crap. Then I see this happened at a couple of credit unions, too. And, I mean, you could see from people, there was one guy, he's like, I'm stuck in my car, there's no banks open, I can't get gas, I'm running on fumes, I have $8,000 in my bank account and $0 on my person, I'm going to have to sleep in my car tonight because of this problem, I'm taking my money out of Chase tomorrow. But, you know, if this happened, if we had, like, some kind of worldwide hack going on or something, you wouldn't be able to go out and get any of this stuff. And when you think of the timing of what's going on at Fukushima and then this bank thing happened yesterday, oh, my gosh, at least have some food, water, enough supplies and stuff to keep you busy for a couple of weeks if things uh -huh. get shut down, because it's really crazy and unpredictable right now. That's right. And, you know, the TEPCO thing is uh, almost a grid-related incident. They're losing their power that's coming into them. It's not their equipment. It's these power lines and the switch gear. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, it, they really had a lot of difficulty isolating it. It took them like 20 hours to figure it out. You know, our country, uh, we were repeatedly told that our grid is antiquated and uh, there's uh, cyber attacks is the new focus for the Pentagon. You know, that virus that we sent to Iran to take out their centrifuges, uh -huh. the, Stux, the Stuxnet virus, escaped just like some other biological weapon. It's, yeah. it's on its own out there in the cybersphere. So, you know, uh, a virus is a virus. You know, I've I seen some things recently. This lower background, there's uh, some viruses that thrive and, and, and some bacteria that are thriving, and none of them seem very healthy. Another thing I want to remind folks, even though we all love mushrooms quite a bit, mm -hmm. They're, uh, once you get <laughs> off the meat part of the food chain, they're really high. They pick it up hard and fast. What kind of mushrooms are you talking about? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Well, I'm talking about the kind you get in the grocery store. <laughs> the kind you put in your salad? I know yeah. I, lo I love mushrooms, but they do accumulate rats. In fact, they could be very helpful in That's using... Right to decontaminate, put mushroom spores in the chemtrails. Uh, yeah, I don't have uh, enough chemtrail soup right now. So, you know, think think about what you'd, you would need, and you can do it for a very small investment. And um, not only do you need duct tape, but I recommend the painter's tape, the blue kind that peels off easily. Jules could tell you why. <laughs> I think she's muted right now, though. We do know a few things about the fuel pools of Fukushima. And I, I pulled up this article and used a couple quotes from it yesterday. This appeared in Washington's blog. 
and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read the part about the totals. And this was coming at it from the per perspective if there was another big earthquake and building number four could collapse and another chain reaction could very likely occur. Manchi had reported the storage pool in the number four reactor building has a total of 1,535 fuel rods or 460 tons of nuclear fuel in it. The seven-story building itself has suffered great damage with the storage pool barely intact on the building's third and fourth floors. The roof has been blown away. If the storage pool breaks and runs dry, the nuclear fuel inside will overheat and explode, causing a massive amount of radioactive substances to spread over a wide area. Both the USNRC and the French nuclear agency and energy company Arriva have warned about this risk. A report released in February by the Independent Investigation Commission on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident stated that the storage pool of the plant's number four reactor has clearly been shown to be the weakest link in the parallel chain reaction crisis of the nuclear disaster. The worst case scenario drawn up by the government includes not only the collapse of the number four reactor pool, but the disintegration of spent fuel rods from all of the other plant's reactors. If this were to happen, residents in the Tokyo metropolitan area would be forced to evacuate because seawater has been pumped into the reactor, the soundness of the structure, concrete corrosion and deterioration is questionable. There are also doubts about calculations made on earthquake resistance as well, said one government source familiar with, with what took place at the time. Fuel rod removal will take at least three years. Will the structure remain standing for that long? Will the seal hold? Will the power hold? Uh, let's see, there was another, all, all the totals added up, I think are at the bottom of this article, and this was from Japan's former ambassador to Switzerland, Mr. Murata, who was invited to speak at the public hearing of the Budgetary Committee of the House of Counselors on March 22, 2012, on the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. Before the committee, he strongly stated that if the crippled building of Reactor 4 with 1,535 fuel rods in the spent fuel pool 100, meters, or 100 feet above the ground collapses. Not only will it cause a shutdown of all six reactors, but will also affect the common spent fuel pool ca containing 6,375 fuel rods located 50 meters from reactor 4. In both cases, the radioactive rods are not protected by containment. Dangerously, they are open to the air. This would cause certainly a global catastrophe like we have never before experienced. He stressed that the responsibility of Japan to the rest of the world is immeasurable. Such a catastrophe would affect us all for centuries. He informed us that the total number of the spent fuel rods at the Fukushima Daiichi site, excluding the rods in the pressure vessels, is 11,421. That's 396 plus 615 plus 566, plus 1535, plus 994, plus 940, plus 6,375. And Robert Alvarez had commented on this too. I mean, this, you know, everybody has just forgotten about this. I mean, this isn't even talked about in the news anymore, and nothing has changed. And there's the article for you guys. I posted it around, I, I must have emailed Drudge like 20 times yesterday. Every time I saw an article that was in a Japan paper or in the BBC, I sent it to them. I don't know if they ever posted anything about it on their website. I sent it to CNN. I sent it to HuffPost. I know HuffPost did run a, sh a story, but it was like a really short article. I mean, it was like one paragraph and you weren't even able to comment under it. It's pretty pathetic considering the seriousness of the situation. And you know, Noki, like, when I think about this, and obviously I've been thinking about it for a while, if anything ever happened to Reactor 4 or, or any of the um, spent fuel pools at the plant, I, I really don't know what to expect from the government in terms of, like, uh -huh. warning people at all. I mean, there's a possibility they wouldn't say anything except to their own family. So if you don't have those supplies, which most of them you can get at the dollar store, you know, extra trash bags in case you need to, like, um, make you know, a I, suit to wear outside it, it, if you have to go anywhere and, you know, the, the you know, tape and stuff. level a pronged attack these days. Yeah, but I uh, think that the stores, the, the stuff would probably disappear pretty quickly. Oh, uh, yeah. Because government workers would be telling all their families. 
you better go get this stuff. You're going to be stuck in your house for a couple weeks. No, and, uh, you know, you still want to have some potassium iodide around. And um, I'm a big believer in turning one of the rooms in your house into what I call a safe room. Uh -huh. Well, to make the investment, there's these air circulating purifiers, and they'll catch everything in the room and bring your particle level in one room of your house way down in case you need to, you know, hunker down. But yeah. that's, I'm big on uh, taping your windows off. But uh, if that massive event occurs, it's going to be a lot like the first, when, it, when they melt, it's going to blow a shitload into the, way up into the higher atmospheres. I yeah. think we've been enjoying less making into the jet stream for a while. Things could actually be worse because this has been going on for so long. Most of it's being channeled into the Pacific Ocean. You said something earlier, it really reminded me of something. It seems to me that when they design these spent fuel pools, they use, they use ultra-pure water in to keep mm -hmm. things from happening. And ever since the meltdown, there's been all kinds of cement and steel and all this crap that's never designed to be in the pools. And Yeah, remember the last time they tried to look in four with a camera, it was too cloudy to see anything, but three was clear, and then yeah. the opposite had been true yeah, before. We're designed... To, specifically for pristine operating conditions. Yeah. So, I mean, if you don't have any of that stuff yet, you should probably... But I think they'd have a couple garden hoses around by now in case they need to run some water in somewhere. I made a post, too, over the last couple of days because it just struck me as kind of funny, is the relationship between Operation Tomodachi, the USS Ronald Reagan, the fact that the USS Ronald Reagan was named after President Ronald Reagan, who uh, used to be a spokesman for GE, so this plume comes out of GE reactors, and I was looking for like a, a ironic commercial about it, and um, and I'm actually I'm going to have Kurt play the clip from what we found. Not only President. <laughs> In, in addition to him promoting GE and nuclear energy, he also promoted, before that, Baraxo, which can That's be used right. for rad decontamination. I mean, seriously? This is some really messed up stuff. Um, Kurt, if you're ready, go ahead and play those two clips from Ronald Reagan. <laughs> From the energy of the atom, invisible to man's eyes, to the vastness of the universe, staggering to his intellect, the frontier of science stretches forth, and the men of science strive to press it back, patiently, tentatively, step by step. Two of the major challenges on this frontier of science are the exploration of outer space and the development of sources of energy. And two men who can tell us about these areas of progress are Dr. Guy Suits, a leader in scientific research, and Dr. Leo Stegg, space scientist. To tell us about progress in energy generation, here's Dr. Suits, director of the General Electric Research Laboratory. Energy is an extremely important driving force in modern civilization. The energy that we have available to us on the farm and in the American factory and in our economy, the mechanical energy, the electrical energy, this energy is the reason for our high standard of living, it makes it possible for one man with his one man power to produce a great deal more than he needs for his own use. So the subject of energy generation, energy conversion is going to be important in modern American industry and in the laboratories of American industry for the indefinite future. We have to have more and better ways of generating energy, more efficient ways of doing so. Now, the bulk of our electrical energy, which is the most important form of energy in modern civilization, is produced today by the turbine generator. Uh, <clears throat> the starting point in generating electricity in a turbine generator is, of course, a fuel. In this case, 
one of the fossil fuels, so-called coal or oil or gas. With this fuel, we generate heat, which generates steam in a boiler, which in turn drives the turbine. You may think of the turbine as being a kind of a windmill. It has vanes like a windmill, and the vanes are driven with a high pressure and high temperature steam to rotate a shaft. The shaft drives the generator, which is a device very much like an electric motor. It produces the electricity, which goes into the transmission line that you see here. And this, of course, finally brings the electric power into the home or to the factory or onto the farm. Now, the turbine generator produces about 90% of the world's electricity. Um, it's a very effective and efficient method of producing bulk electricity. Nothing else has been able to compete with it to date. About 40% of the heat energy that goes into this system comes out over here as electrical energy. That's a high conversion efficiency, as we say. Um, <clears throat> A turbine generator has some disadvantages, too. In order to have this high efficiency, this system must be large. It isn't possible to make a small, efficient turbine generator. Here's great news about two wonderful Baraxo hand cleaning products. First, Baraxo powdered hand soap in a new plastic decorator container. Looks like this on the grocer's shelf, and like this on your bathroom or kitchen sink. Unbelievable. My, my brain does a little flip every time I try to sort out all those connections and just the unbelievable coincidence. Um, speaking of celebrities like Ronald Reagan, I started collecting sick celebrity stories about a year ago just because I had this theory that they fly a lot and they would be exposed more to fallout if it was bad. and um, Recently, there's been a huge increase in the number of celebrities that are not only sick, they're getting sick on planes. Now, probably one of the most famous people that has been quoted recently about um, something that has to do with this is Gwyneth Paltrow. She had an incident that happened in late spring out in her garden in her house in London. And while she was in her garden, she had a feeling like she was having a stroke. She started passing out. Um, she went to the hospital. She had a series of tests that revealed that uh, systemically she was a mess. She was vitamin D deficient. She had anemia. She had thyroid issues. Her liver was congested. She had abnormal hormone imbalances, which is adrenal, and a benign tumor on her ovary that had to be removed. And then later, she ended up having a miscarriage. I mean, does this sound like Fukushima exposure or what? This was in um, late spring of 2011. Now, also recently, uh, the rapper Lil Wayne was hospitalized for seizures, and these seizures started happening while he was on a flight. This was in January, and he, was, he had a number of seizures on the plane. They landed the plane. They took him to the hospital. He was hospitalized. Then last week, he started getting seizures again. Um, they took him to the hospital, they pumped his stomach, they said he had dr drank codeine or something, and maybe that precipitated it, and they let him out of the hospital, and then somebody found him, like, on the floor in his hotel room having seizures again, and it sounded like his condition was pretty serious, but the first time this started happening was while he was on a transcontinental flight. Also, within the last week, Elton John has had to cancel a series of concerts because of illness. Um, another singer, Morrissey, had to cancel his U.S. concerts after being rushed to the hospital. They still don't know what's wrong with him. Justin Bieber passed out and collapsed during a show that he was doing in the U.K. last week. And then the next day, he lashed out at photographers and got into a fight. You know, rads will also cause very aggressive behavior. Kelly Osborne was rushed to the hospital after she started suffering from seizures while her um, a show that she's on was being filmed. She was in the hospital for a few days. They did not find a cause. Valerie Harper has just recently been diagnosed with brain cancer. Kim Kardashian was hospitalized uh, 10 days ago when she started getting sick on a flight from Paris to L.A. 
and the week prior to that she had flown from LA to Nigeria to appear at something and she's like six months pregnant too they thought she might lose the baby they kept her in the hospital for a few days I probably have 10 other stories from people celebrities in the US and I know Loren has dozens of people from the know, UK, uh, including sporting people like guys playing football or soccer that are having heart attacks and can't play anymore and these guys are like 21 Oh, the, uh, there's a lot of athletes with heart problems, but I, I wonder if you you are aware of, and I think everybody would be really interested in knowing that actually uh, a John Wayne movie set was irradiated, and for three weeks they were downwind from the Yucca site, three weeks after 11 bombs were put off, yeah. and half the crew died from radiation uh originating cancers, including probably John Wayne, it's possibly the reason that Howard Hughes went into seclusion. And the movie was called The Conqueror, and they were in the town of St. George, Utah. And the, they knew it was hot. They have photographs of like John Wayne playing with Geiger counters and stuff, but it's really a famous incident. And uh, a lot of there was uh, many deaths attributed directly to this one movie set. That's that's insane. Yeah, <laughs> and I know historically there there are events like that. In fact, Loren and I have been talking about doing a show just about that, about celebrities who have been affected by rads throughout history, and especially most recently with all these stories and them getting sick on planes. I mean, this is some coincidence if that's what it is, that all these people are getting sick and having seizures, and, have, you know, they're all I, I, flying a lot, they're getting exposed to way higher levels than we're getting exposed to on the ground. You're not supposed to fly anyway when you're pregnant. Uh, Most obstetricians tell you that because of uh, the gamma. You know, there's it's just happening in so many arenas from the depleted uranium ammunitions that are now commonly employed. Uh, shielding and cladding and then all this recycled metal that they're gonna in the fit in the foods so uh, it, you really have to screen everything in your own personal biosphere and exert as much control as possible I had a really long talk with Major Fox oh, on yeah. Sunday and for a couple of hours because he's got some ideas about some upcoming meetings and how we could like maybe put together either a Google Hangout or something where we get all these researchers together, something very informal, um, you know, but like kind of like a symposium online since a lot of these people are going to be going to the Free Your Mind conference, which is in oh, Philadelphia, I think, at the end of April. But he said, too, you know, this is all about reducing your full body burden. And that's what you have to keep in mind. When I told him that we were going to be going to Mexico, he was like, wow, can you get out of that? And then, I'm, you know, I just watched this movie on the beach, the old one, <laughs> for the first time like two days ago. And then all this stuff happens at the plant yesterday. And I'm like, wow, we could literally be on the beach when this thing blows over here if they don't get it fixed. Um, I uploaded a couple of sections of the interview that I did with Loren for the two-year anniversary. There's um, three sections so far. I have a fourth section which was is almost done, which I'm going to get to in a second because we have a, a wonderful um, contribution from someone who I think is of absolute historical importance to help me finish up part four, which is going to be on mutations. Um, but I'm breaking them up by topic so that they'll get more views. So I think the shortest one is eight minutes so far, and the longest one is like 26 minutes. And um, there'll probably be eight sections by the time it's done. But some of the comments are under here, just like unbelievable. There are so many people with sick pets, pets getting cancer. Um, sorry to hear about your cat, Jonah. I know how it feels. This is from Rose in the Pines. Odd thing is both me and my son have lost weight over the past two years, not even trying. 
he just visited his sisters in Springfield last night and told me the whole ha family has also, and they're not trying either. I was not too concerned about myself as I need needed to lose something anyway, but hearing it's happening to others for no known reason has made me wonder why. From Jonah 70757, my cat's health dramatically changed by the end of 2011 and began, she began throwing up and losing weight. Other people told me they had cats that were throwing up too. She looked like hell and was suffering. When I would hold her, she was so thin and bony. She would lay her head on my shoulder and just look at me. Poor thing, I felt so horrible. Uh, there were some other postings here. I don't know if it was under this video or the other one about German shepherds getting cancer. And, you know, Jules lost her cat and I lost my dog since then, um, which was kind of out of the blue too. And because animals are lower to the ground like kids, they're going to be exposed to more radiation that's landed on the soil. So yesterday, I'm trying to put together this mutation section, and I wanted to put, I wanted to put side by side images of all the stuff that people have sent us, next to all the stuff that was photographed by TMI, and, and put all that next to the stuff that's like from Chernobyl, and that the, that's all that would be on the video is all these pictures and how they are exactly the same. And so I found this woman, her name is Mary Osborne, and she's like pretty well known because she's a very outspoken critic of the Three Mile Island accident and its aftermath. And something she started doing almost right away was taking pictures of all the mutations she saw in plants. And one of her most famous pictures is one of a two-headed black and white cow uh, from, I believe it was Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. But she she did this very thoroughly and actually mapped it out and I found her number yesterday and called her and next week is going to be the anniversary of the um, Three Mile Island accident and she's actually going to come on the show and talk to us and it, we had just the most amazing conversation everything that has happened to us with this Fukushima situation she went through 25 or 26 or 27, however many years it's been since that happened. Starting from the metallic taste, which everybody had, the downplaying of the incident and how long it took for the real information to get out to the people. And I still don't know actually the full extent of what, you know, the core melt and the releases were on that. Yeah, we're going to cover that next week, and she is going to help us because she actually, her husband worked at TMI, and she knows a lot. She has every map from the Department of Energy. She has everything. She's actually going to be mailing me a packet of information, and I don't know if I've mentioned this on the show before. I know Jules and I have talked about it, but ever since June, I'm only getting my mail sporadically. In fact, I had a call from um, Southern Utah University today because my daughter had applied there for college, and they sent us back um, the information saying that she had been accepted, and it got returned to them saying that we had moved. And we haven't moved, but for some reason, half of my mail, and it's always the really important stuff, like college applications and court dates and things like that, that we're not getting. And so when this woman told me she wanted to mail me out this packet, I said, you know, could you send it signature guarantee because I'm not getting all of my mail. And she's like, oh, you too? She's like, that's been happening to me for years. My goodness. And she's been followed. Um, she may have even been bugged based on some conversations. I'll have her get into all that, but she's a, a really sharp woman. She knows everything about the accident. And in fact, her focus is still that. She's very active, although she's not online, because she's had a lot of problems with her computer and viruses and things like that. So I'm going to try to work with her to get that, all that fixed. And I gave her some suggestions yesterday, because it would be wonderful to have her input with all of these other people that are following Fukushima. I mean, th this, this conversation that I had with, with her was unreal. I couldn't believe how much she knew and how similar the stories are between what people from following Fukushima have gone through and what she went through. And what does she do now? Is, is well, she, she still works, and she's an activist, and 
the way she gets all of her um, her nuke info is by newsletters, since uh, she's not on the computer. So I'm looking very forward to having a discussion with her next week for uh, the anniversary of the Three Mile Island accident. And because she follows that accident so closely, she doesn't know that much about Fukushima, except that it's bad. So there, there's still a zone around that power plant that's kind of hot and everything? A no-go zone? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if they're how far that might extend. Of course, the story yeah. was that the releases weren't bad. In fact, we have another clip to play. This aired on Al Jazeera. On a quiet street in Etters, Pennsylvania, in this house, the current nuclear crisis in Japan is stirring up powerful memories. It would be a very dangerous, uh, lethal... Charles and Helen Hocker live just a few kilometres from Three Mile Island, also known as TMI, the scene of the worst ever nuclear accident in the US. And they say in Japan, people stay inside, close their doors, uh, that doesn't work. In 1979, one of the reactors at TMI overheated and triggered a partial core meltdown. Radioactive gas was released. There were no forced evacuations, but thousands still left their homes for a short time. Investigations concluded a combination of human and technical error was to blame. To this day, government and nuclear officials maintain there were no injuries or deaths resulting from the accident. Charles and Helen's daughter, Patty, was diagnosed with cancer in 1984. She died just two years later at the age of 40. Her parents blamed Three Mile Island. Yes. No doubt. No doubt. She died in my arms. When we took her home. <laughs> Wasn't long, was it? No, and uh, the difference was that Charles never thought that she was dying. No, she asked and me. And I, but I was with her every day. I'd be with her taking care of her, and I knew. Despite the ongoing impact on communities close to the Three Mile Island plant, finding scientific evidence of radiation exposure and the level of exposure isn't easy. Most official studies conclude that the fallout from the accident here was low level, but at the time it was enough to bring the nuclear industry in the United States to a standstill. For the next 30 years after TMI, no new licenses to produce nuclear energy were granted. But in recent years, industry lobbyists and nuclear executives have made significant headway and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is now reviewing 20 license applications. Helen Hocker is taking medication for problems with her thyroid. It eases the physical pain, but there's no prescription for the emotional pain of losing a child. It's so unfair, so unfair. If you've done something that caused people to die, at least you should confess, tell the truth. Do you think they ever will? No, never. Kath Turner, Al Jazeera, Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. That was actually one of um, Mary Osborne's friends. Um, I believe her name is Miss Hawker that was interviewed by Al Jazeera. It's so nice to see Al Jazeera covering <laughs> Fukushima and Three Mile Island. I found yeah. another clip, too. By Al Jazeera yeah, yesterday. Go to Russia to get my news. <laughs> I found another clip, and we've always kind of wondered what happened at the Onagawa plant because it was never really um, acknowledged publicly that I knew of that uh, Onagawa had problems. And as I was going through these Al Jazeera clips, I found one that was that said Onagawa was having problems and the radiation levels had spiked and that now they were getting back under control. And I think that was released like on March 13th or 14th. And so, I mean, it's obvious they lied from that clip because they said there, there weren't any problems going on. And here, right in this clip, they said Onagawa what are you talking about? had a very serious situation. This was like right, right after the tsunami. Right, right. I'll see if I can find that and, and drop it into chat. I shared it with a couple people. Well, they made sure they only spoke about one reactor the whole time. Mm-hmm, which that continues to this thing. day, like, you know, like the, the possibility that Daini was ha having power problems, too. One of the things that Loren had brought up during this interview is that her mother lived in California during the Chernobyl accident, and there, the fallout from Chernobyl went all over the Northern Hemisphere. That one reactor was half the size of the smallest reactor 
at Fukushima, which is reactor one. And then I came across this article yesterday that um, about the increase in Alzheimer's disease. It's considered an epidemic now, and it's a deadlier threat to the elderly, although Loren's mother wasn't that old when she got it. I think she was like 50, uh, or maybe even younger than that. The disease is now the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., and figures released Tuesday showed that deaths from the disease have increased by 68%. It's an epidemic. It's on the rise, and currently there's no way to de delay it, prevent it, or cure it said Maria Carrillo, a neuroscientist with the Alzheimer's Association. More than 5 million people in the U.S. have the disease, she says, and that number could reach nearly 14 million by 2050. One reason that the deaths are going up is that deaths from other causes like heart disease and prostate cancer are going down, and we're living longer, she says. Unfortunately, age is still the greatest factor for the disease. There are still no effective treatments for it. If a person living with Alzheimer's disease in their, in their 70s, it actually doubles their mortality risk. It's still tricky to decide when to blame Alzheimer's for the disease of a particular person, though, says Susan Mitchell, a professor of medicine at Harvard, uh, because Alzheimer's patients tend to have other health problems as well. And another article that was covered in the Japan Times over the weekend was... <sighs> Yeah, this was published on March 11th of 2013. They talk about the incident that happened at Byron on January 30th of 2012. And so, I mean, this, this is appearing in the Japan papers, but not in the U.S. papers. On January 30th, 2012, Byron Nuclear Generating Station lost operability to all of its safety-related equipment. At the time, Jim Hazen was the nuclear station operator responsible for the affected reactor, one of two at the Exelon-owned nuke plant in Byron, Illinois. NSO drive nuclear reactors like pilots fly jetliners. It's mostly autopilot, except when something goes wrong. Hazen surveyed the control room's instruments and advised taking actions that would trigger the plant's diesel generators, switching the plant to backup power. According to multiple sources familiar with the incident's details, including at least one who was directly involved, this was clearly the proper action to take. But the shift manager, Ed Bendis, rejected that advice. Hazen repeated it. Sources claim he repeated it several times. Bendis didn't relent, and the reactor went without safety equipment for eight minutes, which is an eternity in fission time. <laughs> I love this quote. For eight minutes, you've raised your middle finger to the meltdown gods, one reactor operator said. If anything else happened in that window, it's a safe bet. One problem causes another, and then you're screwed. Without any operable safety equipment or a clear idea of what had caused the accident, operators knew the plant was vulnerable to any number of accident scenarios, ranging from the trivial to the catastrophic. I'll drop that article into chat for you guys. It's a pretty long one. It really ticked me off, though, yesterday that or Drudge and, and all these other news places weren't covering the Fukushima blackout. There was a, a blackout of the blackout. Right. <laughs> Another really interesting article that I came across, and this was on uh, Washington's blog, too, was the potential cost of a nuclear accident is so high that it's a secret. In fact, it's evaluated a range of disaster scenarios that might occur at a plant in France. Best case scenario cost came to $760 billion, more than a third of France's GDP. At the other end of the spectrum, $5.8 trillion, which is over three times France's GDP, a devastating amount. It's so large that France could not possibly deal with it, and that's just if one facility went bad. So where, um, where was that last re reactor you were telling us about, the Byron? Where is that located? That is in uh, Byron, Illinois. I believe it's northwest of Chicago. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I had a friend who was actually working in the area and took pictures of the, the steam events that were happening. Huge steam releases. And then they had a fire in their turbine building. There were a couple things that went wrong. Nothing on the news. I think Dutch had put out a video, too, because the air was blowing into Chicago that day, 
when that happened and there was trouble. There was trouble with up and round Chicago with the reactor up there. Yeah. yeah. And then we never heard anything else. Well, we're getting to the end of the show. I will um, drop the uh, the panic clock into chat again for you guys. We have three days, four hours, zero minutes, and 27 seconds before we really, really need to worry about this spent fuel situation. So try to have some fun in the Can meantime. Can I uh, plug uh, radia- radwatch.info on Facebook? If there's stuff that's going to hit the continent, we'll put up some charts. We'll be watching. We'll be watching. There, there will be lots of discussions going on because the last thing you want to do is like get in your car and drive somewhere else if you don't know what you're driving into. So you have to take weather into account. You have to take the rad levels into account and kind of project what is going to happen based on what's happening at the plant. And that changes, you know, every couple hours. Watch um, any news also for updates on the situation there. Thank you, Jules. Thank you very much, Kurt, for being here. Good luck with your um, articles. And we will see you guys on Thursday. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.